Awesome. Um, yeah, so as Lavanya said, um, I'm Stacy. I'm a deep learning engineer at uh, Weights and Biases, and I'm going to talk about benchmarks today um, and how they can hopefully support um, collaborative deep learning for Planet. Um, just as a quick outline, um, I want to focus on Drought Watch because that's the most recent benchmark. Um, that's the one I've been thinking about the most. Um, and from there, um, expand into new and upcoming benchmarks, talk a bit about the collaborative features that benchmarks enable, and then um, how you might participate, and um, then get into Q&A. So I can also adjust depending on what kinds of questions folks have. Um, so jumping right into Drought Watch, uh, and this is work with uh, Andrew Hobbs of UC Davis. And it actually started as his um, PhD project in which um, a data set of um, over 100,000 images, satellite images of uh, northern Kenya was annotated by um, experts who live in that area um, to indicate the level of drought at the location. Um, and the reason uh, this is a useful and important data set is that uh, drought is a serious and increasing problem um, in northern Kenya in particular, um, but in lots of regions around the world that's uh, worsening with climate change. And uh, there's an existing program in Kenya um, started by the International uh, Livestock Research Institute in uh, 2011 that uh, uses index insurance or a measure of, um, in this case, how bad the environmental conditions are to uh, pay uh, folks, farmers, or in this case, uh, nomadic herders, um, relative to how bad the conditions are that year uh, so that they can use the money to um, uh, support themselves and their families and compensate for the livestock loss, buy food, et cetera. And this program has been running uh, for, yeah, I guess, nine years now, um, and it's expanding to other countries. Um, and it's working pretty well, um, except when there's a difference in the prediction and the actual drought, uh, then that can um, convert to a, a large cost in, in human terms um, based on, you know, the either farmers not getting as much money as they should or the wrong individuals getting the wrong payout. Um, so yeah, as I said, uh, this index-based livestock insurance currently monitors drought conditions using satellite. Um, when drought occurs uh, in Kenya, it, uh, the program transfers resources to pastoralists, which is the name for these uh, pneumatic herders uh, with mobile money, and then they can use that to cover household uh, expenses or livestock needs. And I have here um, all the wonderful folks who supported the data collection uh, for this which is Cornell University, Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future, and uh, ILRI. Um, the, uh, the issue with the current method is that um, it's, it's, it's pretty good, but it doesn't actually differentiate between um, edible plants and non-edible plants from satellite. Um, the current method uses Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, um, which basically compares the green, um, how green it looks from a satellite image. Um, but as you can see, the problem is that this doesn't distinguish between uh, edible and inedible plants. And the idea and the, what led to the creation of this data set was to crowdsource expert labels of forage quality and then use computer vision to assess the drought conditions better. Um, so what, what does the data actually look like? We have uh, ground level labels, and um, these were actual uh, folks in Kenya who walked around to the location with an iPad and um, labeled what the conditions look like on the ground at a particular geolocation uh, with a scale from zero to three for um, how many cows that location can feed. Um, zero being none, total drought, and three being three or more cows, so that's you know, really uh, pretty good forage quality. Um, and they also took some ground level images. So we have those for validation of the overall uh, data set. And here you can see some examples of what that might look like in practice and why it could be hard to tell, you know, just by looking at the amount of green that's in the satellite image. So that's the ground level labels. Um, those are linked with uh, Landsat satellite images uh, from the same place and time. And um, there's higher resolution and uh, 
more precise satellite imagery available now, but not at the time that this data set was collected. So potentially with um, improved imagery, we could improve the accuracy of the model. And the goal is to uh, use only these satellite images to output the prediction or the drought score, uh, zero being drought and three being really good quality. And you can see from some of these example images that it's it's pretty hard. And the model is actually only looking at the center region in, um, in these examples. Uh, so that's an overview of the data set. Uh, now I want to get into how we frame this as a benchmark. So initially, we launched it in August of last year, uh, right around uh, the CDPR conference. And um, since then, so I guess it's been, a little, it's been about nine months. Um, aside from the original authors, we've had uh, nine participants uh, log over uh, two and a half thousand experiment runs to the benchmark. Um, the validation accuracy, which is the metric that we're using to compare models, you know, how much, how much better can we do uh, using deep learning methods on this data set? And it's a fixed data set, so comparison is easier. Um, that's, that's been the improvement just from community submissions. And um, one particularly cool outcome is that um, there's a, a paper going into the Vision for Agriculture workshop at CDPR 2020 on uh, climate adaptation or uh, reliably predicting from imbalanced satellite data by Rachit Rawal and Prabhu Pradhan um, that cite the Drought Watch benchmark uh, and the data set. And this is uh, an inspiring indication that folks are actually building on the existing benchmark data set, looking at the code and using the models to support and accelerate the research, which is uh, really what we want to encourage with these projects. Um, and of course, we're, we're just getting started. Um, I'm gonna jump into a report shortly, and here's an overview of what we've done to improve the performance. Basically, at the very beginning of this project, I trained a, uh, a very simple convolutional neural net to um, predict, given the satellite image, whether it's you know, from zero to three on the, on the drought uh, scale. And an ongoing task is improving the performance of this model which includes exploring different architectures, tuning different hyperparameters, um, also looking at data augmentation, um, because in the original data set, um, for example, there's 11 spectral bands for every satellite image, and some of those are noisy because of clouds or other factors. So looking at the variance in that data, perhaps eliminating some spectral bands, filtering out the clouds. Um, there's a class imbalance, so about 60% of the data set is actually drought, um, which makes it harder to, to train a, a balanced model. Um, we also have those labeled ground photos that I mentioned, which we could potentially use to label more data and cross-reference them with the satellite imagery. Um, and finally, like I said, we only have uh, a label for the very center of the satellite image. And the satellite image itself is actually covers a much larger area than we are able, able to label. Um, so perhaps by clustering those um, regions of the same size, we could label more of the off-center pixels in the satellite imagery. Um, and I'm going to try to jump into the report that I made. Does that, does that still show up? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, this is a report covering, sort of summarizing the work that's happened on this benchmark. Again, an overview of the data. And um, you can jump in here with um, really clear code on how to get started. I um, plotted the validation accuracy for different submissions. So you can sort of see that the improving trend over time here, there's a lot of different submissions. Um, I went through and you can actually click through the different submissions that folks have made. Um, so uh, the current leader is um, this user Ubamba98 with a 77.8% uh, validation accuracy. Um, and that was using EfficientNet. Um, and you can, from the benchmark, click into some of these approaches and see you know, how folks are, are trying to improve on the baseline model. Um, so it looks like using extra convolutional and dropout layers helped. Um, fine tuning ResNet 50 helped uh, in this case. And also um, RIC 137 tried Inception ResNet v2 with custom activation functions and a clocked learning rate. And we can sort of plot this improvement here over time based on when folks submitted. And you know, 2% is 
is definitely an improvement. And these are folks who just decided that this data is cool and they want to uh, work on it um, and either use it to publish their own papers or just contribute to improving this, this concrete model. Um, and there's a lot of room to keep, to keep making it better because even these um, very sophisticated architectures are, are still pretty close to the original baseline. Um, here I kind of cover how I developed the original baseline, which is just a nice um, use case of reports to say, you know, here's what I tried in this phase. Here's how I finally got to an improvement. Um, for me, you know, adding class weights because it's imbalanced and then um, actually removing some of the channels that were noisy um, in increased the accuracy by 15%, uh, which is pretty amazing. And then I have also set it up with a hyperparameter sweep, which is an awesome feature you can try um, to just explore what some of the combinations might be that improve validation accuracy. And then you can you know, see um, which uh, regions of the hyperparameter space correspond to better performance. So here, you know, it looks like learning rate pretty much varies, maybe L3 size, we wanna keep a little lower and so on. You can also check, you know, what the worst performance is um, by selecting this one run. Um, and there's lots of ideas for what to try next here at the end of the report. Um, and at this point, I'll hop back to, um, to the slides. Oh, I guess one other thing I um, wanted to show is that you can log the actual examples in weights and biases, and you can see the model, uh, model's predictions here on the training data, or sorry, the validation data, but you could log, log either one. Um, yeah, so hopping back, um, an aspect that I haven't, uh, touched on yet, those were sort of the concrete details of what this um, problem um, is like and what we're trying to solve. Um, right now, Andrew is using historical data to estimate the economic advantage of um, deploying a model with this improved index. So how much better would the predictions have to be, how much more accurate the model would have to be, and how that would translate to um, improvement in terms of payouts to the farmers, et cetera. Um, and the next step is partnering with uh, ILRI and Takaful to actually deploy this model. So ideally to replace um, the current model that uses the normalized difference vegetation index um, and um, really close the loop on uh, letting you know, the, the broader world have access to this improved accuracy. And that's a really important component of benchmarks is that we want to see the solution actually deployed in the real world. Um, in terms of you know, the research contributions, there's a lot of potential in this project to aggregate with other data, for example, other crops like maize, cassava, rice, um, use it in other regions, uh, whether that's you know, nearby um, Kenya or potentially in completely different ecosystems, fine tuning across several models um, and transfer learning might do better than starting from scratch. And then um, this generalizes to any agricultural metric. Um, basically, if you have any ground level measure or index that's geo-referenced, like uh, a certain crop yield at a particular location, um, you know, how much visual space the crop uh, takes up, maybe how much of it is affected by a certain pest, et cetera, then uh, you can use a similar model to basically make a prediction of that metric from satellite images alone which means you don't need to send folks out into the field. You don't need to do a much more expensive labeling process, uh, provided you can train this initial model. Um, I will take a moment here to jump into the other benchmarks. I know we've, we've been focused on uh, DroughtWatch for concreteness, um, but there's a lot of them. You can find them at wandb.com slash benchmarks. Um, the uh, other really big one that we did in partnership with GitHub uh, is CodeSearchNet, uh, which um, looks at um, programming code uh, language in, uh, in six different languages, I believe, and tries to uh, learn a mapping from between that and comments from a bunch of open source code that um, GitHub has shared. Uh, and that lets you do things like uh, search in natural language for a query like, 
how do I start a web server or how do I copy a file, specify the language and then go directly to the code that does it. And that's just one of the applications. Um, you know, the, the ultimate goal is understanding uh, code the way that we understand language. Um, and there's been a lot of activity on this benchmark. This is just the, the overview you can see in the leaderboard. Um, if it updates um, that there's, you know, tons and tons of submissions to this one and you see them coming in. Um, so that's a very exciting um, other benchmark you might be interested in. There's a space for discussions. Um, there's also a ton of other benchmarks. Um, there's another one with aerial data, which is this aerial segmentation by drone deploy, where um, we have um, images from drones, so drone footage shared by drone deploy, uh, where we're trying to label what the drone is seeing. So in this case, you might get an image like this along with an elevation map. And what you want to label is, you know, these are houses, uh, this is vegetation, maybe this is a, a body of water, et cetera. Um, and again, this comes with, you know, a really nice data set, uh, nice code to read it in and instructions on, on how to get started and train the baseline model. Uh, but of course, you're not required to use any of that. Um, so folks have, you know, written completely their own training script. You don't have to use any of the fast AI the Keras frameworks, um, and it's exciting to see how folks have uh, gone on to uh, improve on the initial baseline that we supply. Uh, yeah, and on that page, uh, you'll see a bunch of them. There, uh, there's we, we try to go for a variety, but as I said, we're just getting started, so a lot of them are vision based. Um, there's a really cool one where um, there's a spoiler alert for the witness game, um, but that uh, can, can be a fun way to explore vision um, without giving away the spoiler. Um, and we're hoping to keep adding a bunch of these. One that I'm uh, working on right now is uh, parsing structured data for uh, campaign finance receipts. So um, that entails from plain text figuring out Parsing it as a receipt, meaning who paid, how much, for what ad. And currently that data is required to be publicly released, but it's not required to be easily readable. Um, so there's thousands of these receipts that are readable by a human, but not, um, not in aggregate by a machine. Um, so that's an exciting benchmark that we hope to have up soon. Um, and in general, we hope that these benchmarks are useful for learning new skills as they uh, sh walk you through a project, give you a good data set to work on, maybe a good excuse to try a new framework, um, see what other people have tried. It's good for reproducibility when it's written up this way. Um, I don't know, I haven't shown the exact code, but it's easily accessible from any of these benchmark pages. Um, the idea is that you can just step through the instructions and immediately start training a model. And it's already set up to log all of the relevant hyperparameters, config, metrics to weights and biases so you can both see the life cycle of someone else training their model and their workflow um, and you can structure your further work on top of that instead of starting from from zero um, i'm excited about the real world impact of these benchmarks and i'm uh, really trying to find more that are focused on environmental sustainability climate change uh, positive social impact um, but really the application is useful for anything. I think any distributed team with shared goals can uh, structure a benchmark, say this is the metric that we care about, here's all of our different um, models that we're training, how we're approaching it, and using the existing weights and biases feature to be, features to basically collaborate on that. And some ways that you can participate, uh, if you'd like, is you can uh, join one of our existing benchmarks. Um, you can definitely start a new benchmark if you have a data set that you're excited about. Um, you can email me with any uh, benchmark, benchmarks that you think would be cool. Um, and then I want to generally encourage everyone as, as they do this or as they work on any machine learning project to, to share intermediate results. Um, I notice that the more folks write up their approach and describe what they tried and what they're doing, the easier it is for everyone else hopping onto the project. To, um, to catch up and know what's already happened and not be reinventing the wheel. 
Um, and I think collectively, the more we do that, the faster we'll, we'll coalesce around solutions to these, to these important problems. Um, yeah, and then just growing our community. I'm sure a lot of you are already in the Slack, but uh, here's the link again. I think finding collaborators there, finding projects to work on there, getting ideas um, is one way that we'll continue to build up solutions to these. Um, yeah, and that's, that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions, uh, jump into uh, any of the details. And um, yeah, again, if you're excited about benchmarks in any form, please email me. Uh, we're just getting started. Thank you, Stacy. This is what I love about Stacy. The rest of the company is like building products, writing code, and she is like actually building things to do good in the world, which you know is very nice. Um, and we appreciate that you uh, put so much thought into every single product that you build, and you think about the, its impact into the world. And that ties into the first question from Michael, which is, um, is there a government or nonprofit entity that your te uh, team is in contact with to put the findings from DroughtWatch um, to good use to save lives? Yeah, so that's all through my collaborator, Andrew Hobbs, and the International Livestock Research Institute, and Tapaful is, I think, the other company. Um, and um, he's also happy to answer questions and excited for more collaborators. As he's finishing his PhD thesis, his he's going to transition into full-time making this work. Uh, and I have a question. Uh, so what problems uh, make for good benchmarks? So, you know, if people are thinking about pitching you a benchmark, what should they? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think what we really need right now is to see more examples of, of collaboration. So anything where um, you think existing approaches haven't worked that well, or you really want to invite more perspectives. Um, I mean, really, any benchmark is good, but I think the more we can uh, see how this tool actually enables folks to collaborate with each other, as opposed to maybe just, you know, one person solving the whole thing right away, um, that would kind of be less, less interesting because we don't get to see the evolution of ideas in the space of possibilities. That makes sense. Uh, and I know we've talked about this internally, but people might have questions. How is this different from Kaggle? Because you think about this so differently, right? <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Um, one thing that gets me about Kaggle is a framing where, um, you know, all, all of the code is secret and there's a certain um, deadline until which everyone works competitively to develop their solutions. And then there might be a collaborative phase and of course there are, you know, non-competitive framings of this. Um, but what I'm really excited about with benchmarks is making it inherently collaborative and hoping that folks are motivated by solving the problem and by learning more about the space and, and working with each other than they are by, you know, the, the prize money or just the um, sort of the recognition. Although I'm hoping to get recognition in here too ideally even in a way where it's not just like, these are the lines of code I got and this is the improvement I made, but here's how I managed to explain my ideas. Here's, here's why you know, I thought this approach might be helpful because um, I think that part is really missing from just submitting the code that works or just you know, passing, having some model that does something on the validation set that, that might be really good, um, but then we don't know why it works or how to uh, transfer it to other contexts. 